Hello, builders of good. Thank you for joining us on the Build Good Fundraising Podcast. Fundraising isn't easy, but it should be simple. So on this show, we take the mystery out of raising money for your nonprofit. Now, on every episode, we coach you to build your fundraising like a flywheel. The flywheel has five parts. Number one is listening to donors. Number two is engaging donors. Number three is asking the right people for the right things. Number four is celebrating every gift. And number five is reporting back in a responsive and real time way. So if you master the five parts of the flywheel, your fundraising flywheel will start to spin more reliably. You will grow your income and you'll also grow your career. Every week, we focus on building one part of the flywheel. And today, we are focusing on engaging. And we're specifically focusing on engaging at scale. Now, oftentimes on this podcast, we talk about mass level fundraising, but we talk about doing it in a way that feels super personal, that feel that we put a lot of care and thought and creativity into it. And even though you're doing something at a mass level, talking to many people at the same time, you're doing it in a way where it still feels like you put just as much effort and, and craft and care and love into it as if you were just talking to one person. So today we are talking about engaging at scale by creating better content, much better content, content that can help you you know, be reach just as many people as organizations that have a much bigger budgets than you, that have a lot more staff than you, that are that where you look at them and you say, "Oh man, I wish I could do that." Well, content is kind of the great equalizer. Creativity is a great equalizer. You can put out pretty amazing stuff, and that is on par with some of these larger nonprofits that you might look up to. So, what if? That could be the case for you. What if you create content for your ads, emails, and social media that reached more people than organizations that were larger than you? Well, then our part two with Cam Bartlett will get into some stories and into some formulas and into some frameworks he's used to do just that. He's used these to take small shops to get just as many, just as much engagement on, on content than organizations 10x the size. Um, of orgs that he was working on. And the best part is you can do this whether it's just you or a team of 20. So let's get into it. Here's my conversation with Cameron Bartlett. Hey, Cam, thanks for coming back. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I'm glad to be here. So we're talking about content today. And uh, maybe for some people listening, they might be like content. Okay, why why is content important? So let's just start with making the case for better content. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, the type of content that I, I've seen work the best for organizations, and we'll we'll kind of break down this more as we continue talking, but I like to call these celebration content, right? So this is being able to show your impact and 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 tell it in a way that you know sure you can do this during big campaigns and tell stories of uh, people whose lives were changed but you can also do it with quick wins consistently you know every week or every month or you know throughout the year what this does is it actually engages people at every stage of a donor journey or you mentioned the flywheel right like you're looking to attract and engage you know with people and then uh, invest in those relationships so that they grow your cause for you right and so this content it attracts completely new people because it allows them to see what what an impact they could make. Uh, it the people who have been donating for years, they're like, heck yeah, this is this is why I give to this organization. Like it feels great. Like I'm being thanked by this content. I'm I'm able to really feel like the dollars I'm giving are and see where that's going. And then and then it helps up level people who have never given before to make their first gift. Those who have given to say, I want to commit to something longer, or even like. I'm going to start fundraising for this organization. I'm going to start spreading this cause because of, you know, I'm consistently seeing these wins. I'm consistently seeing the impact. I don't feel like I'm just giving this to some cause and hoping it works out. I get to continually be reminded that it's working and your content can do that um, and help everyone at every stage move further along in that donor journey. Yeah. 
one of the stumbling blocks that that we might sometimes have when we think about content is that we think content needs to be really professional, really shiny, a lot of investment, like hire videographer, hire photographers have like really beautiful mm-hmm. content. Can you help us think about content in a way that is more approachable? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, the polish of a post or an article or an email, that's one component. And it might make, it might get you more engagement. It might get you less engagement. It's interesting, you know, like over the years, especially working in social media, I I loved starting my career in social media because it was such an experimental time. There were new platforms launching every day. There were new platforms dying every day. You didn't know where to invest your time. You just had, you know, a few core channels and then a lot of tests. I can't tell you how many platforms and strategies that built up for, for, you know, social networks that no longer exist. Right. And so what was really cool is it was just a time of experimentation. Um, And every component of what you put together, every word you write into an email, every photo or video you use in a social post, it tells, it tells you these little pieces of data that allow you, if you look at them and look where no one else is looking, you can find ways to reach a lot more people than those who are just thinking about like, okay, well, we need to post a photo four times a week and let's get a video out, you know, on TikTok, like, you know, a few times a month or whatever, right? Like some people think that they just have to create this, um, a pattern and they're not looking at these little tiny details. Why I mentioned polish, meaning like, is it a high produced photo or video versus, you know, a lot of times when we would post on social for say like a, a, a rescue for human tra- uh, trafficking, right? A lot of times the photo that did the best, that got the most engagement was, it was actually more important that it was a real photo. It was actually of like, you know, local police breaking down the door and like ar- arresting the traffickers. It was the room where like children were being held and now they're free. It was, and that was often just like maybe an iPhone photo, maybe a flip, literally like a flip phone photo. It was very low resolution. It was dark. There was no, like, nobody set up, like, a a ring light and then took a photo, right? Like, it was just like, this is what we were able to get. And so it was a lot more important that it was authentic than that it was well lit and and staged and and polished. So the authenticity is, is is something to look at. The how the high resolution or low resolution photo is something to look at and determine which of your posts get, get more. Is it the, the words you use, the, the length of your descriptions, the what's in your photos, the formatting, you know, when we started, you know, creating a lot of these celebration posts for different nonprofits, whether you're food or, or water or education or, you know, spon- child sponsorships or conservation or animals or a- anything, right? Like you want to start, pulling together the pieces of the components of your content and determine which of those make the biggest difference. So here's a, here's a good example. When you're writing emails, what words seem to stand out? When, what, what of those emails that get higher open rates? You know, look at, look at all of your emails and see which ones people open the most. What do you see is consistent? We started seeing things like when we use numbers, you know, so like three girls were rescued or the ages of people who were rescued, or we noticed that when we used people's names or said the word you, or, you know, we, or things like that in the subject line, people were more likely to open. We saw that like, we would test out things like breaking news or, you know, things like that. And we saw that those, those started to get good engagement. If you look at those that get the best opens and those that get the worst opens, what consistencies are you seeing between those you start adding those up together and you're like, okay, well, we get 10% increase for this and 20% increase for this and 5% increase for doing these types of things. And then soon your content is reaching twice as many people, three times as many people. You're getting more opens, you're getting more clicks, you're getting more donations because you're paying attention to those little details. Yeah. Becky's on this, on this call. One of the best performing emails she wrote for a food bank. I can't remember the exact subject line. It was something like 123 families something mm. like that and and it was a very short email just plain text and it was like hey over the last of the last few weeks this many families signed up for a christmas hamper from the food bank and oh, very wow. just like in the moment update like here's a rep here's how many families sign up in the last two weeks and we've got to deliver these things two weeks from now can you help right yeah i i want to 
dive a little bit more um, into something that you said, which is the authenticity piece. One of the greatest challenges to fundraising in 2023 is like the, this massive lack of trust or decline of trust. We've been through a pandemic. We've had loss of trust in institutions, government, media, whatever the whatever, however you stand on any of those issues, it's across the board. Is is that there's a decline in trust, and unfortunately, nonprofits are associated as institutions, and and have sort of been part of that like loss of trust, right? And content can be one of the ways that you actually build trust, if it is very like you said in the moment, if it's very authentic, if it's like this just happened. Here's a here's an iPhone picture of this thing that just happened. Can you talk to us a little bit more about just having that mindset of content isn't just this thing that we spray at everyone. It's actually like an exercise of building trust and, and relationship. Yeah, absolutely. It actually makes me think of two things. And, and one of those is on establishing that story gathering process, Mike. And I think the second is actually around something I don't talk as much about, but community engagement. So let's start with establishing your, your content gathering process. You want to find a way to find those wins and see how you can get them more consistently, right? So like, you know, I mentioned with the human trafficking nonprofit, like those rescues were were the best type of content, but also it was, we, I remember one post that did really well and it was showing this one street in a city that had historically had children for where you could pay to have sex with them, right? Like lined up on the street, in the in public right and so we had obviously done done work to to end this crime but also like not just like arrest those people who were who were the perpetrators there and so forth but actually eradicate this area of that this horrible crime right and so we we showed this picture of 15 years later this is now a safe place for like families and children and like everyone this this crime is gone from here and you could see that 15 year difference of like how we described what it was before and now how like safe and welcoming and uh, it is now and and that transformation showing that over time uh you know there are milestones you hit too like i remember one that we talked about like we had reached i don't know a groundbreaking amount of uh, arrests and we showed you know in I think it was in, in Cebu City in the Philippines, we'd shown like an 86% reduction in in child trafficking there. Like just establishing and, and celebrating those milestones are also really great. As If you're a, uh, think about it too, like there are so many other small moments too. Like if you're an, an education nonprofit, I like thinking of this one, right? Because there are so many points. Some, some some kid is now who's struggling in school is now in your program and they're doing great. They just got an A on their test. They just you know completed a report. They graduated onto the next level. They they graduated from your program and from school and now they're off going to college and doing something else. They're they've come back to the program afterwards and they have this great job now that they get to share with um, and then now they're helping back into the program and then now they're volunteering and helping other students like there are so many points that you get to celebrate if you can't if you can't do a ton to, to celebrate um the impact of those you're, you're helping especially like maybe you need to protect their identities or things like that you know then you can talk about your volunteers and your staff and like their experiences talk about donors and how it changed their life when they started uh donating to your organization there are a lot of moments that you can you can celebrate and even just on the the point of anonymity as well like obviously we're we're actually representing a lot of these clients in court when we were at IJM and some or other organizations that are specifically working in human trafficking so we we actually had to protect the details of a case and the identity of the people that of the that we were representing and the children and so forth and so in a lot of cases we had to change details of the stories we had to use pseudonyms we had to use representational pho photography and we were just honest with with you know our content we put that in the social posts we put that in the emails and landing pages everything like Hey, this is this is representational. Some of the details had to be changed to protect the identity of of the person, people in the story. Like, and honestly, people were really fine with that. Honestly, like that didn't hurt our engagement at all. If anything, like I think it helped people trust us even more that we were saying, "Hey, we had to change some of this. It's not the exact story. Some of this is different." And people actually felt like, "Okay, well, I, I feel good that we're actually, you know, you're prioritizing that." And it didn't seem to make a big difference. Um, just to, to go to that community engagement stage for a second and to think about 
you know, early on in my career, again, working in social media, I worked in the music industry for a bit. I worked with marketing agencies. And then I was like, can we take these strategies that are working and making all these companies money and, and help, you know, do fundraising for nonprofits. And one of those strategies that was really important was growth hacking. Growth hacking was how do you figure out a way to do what these big companies are doing with big budgets and you do it for less and you find a way to like, you know, people will do this with growth hacking into products where they'll, well, they'll find ways to scale just by coding into their products, a way that things start to kind of propel themselves forward. And, and community engagement was one of those hacks early on that allowed us to really reach a lot of people. So I think of like a music uh, blog that I worked with early in my career. And when I started, I think there were like 40 Twitter followers, right? And, 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 just a few years, we grew it to over 50,000 followers across their different social channels and for email lists and all, this, all these other things. And a big part of what we would do is really try to engage more deeply and authentically with people. So, you know, there's some things that you can just scale, right? You're just like, let's run ads and let's try to get a bunch of leads. And like, that's something you can scale because you just put more money in and more leads come out and you just keep optimizing the process. But there was a lot of manual work early on in the community engagement realm where I would actually reach out to new people who I wanted to like connect and follow with us or read our content or watch our videos. And I would go to their Twitter profile and I would find something, some commonality. I would find bands that they like. So I'd search through and find people who followed certain bands that we were covering. And I would do a few things. One, I would change our Twitter bio to say that we were featuring... I don't know, Paramore or Linkin Park or some band that people knew around the time, I would put in our bio new photos from Paramore. And then I would find people who liked Paramore. I would go and search them. I would I would start conversations with them. And a lot of times I didn't know some of the bands that we cover. So I'd actually go and I'd start listening to some of their songs. And so that way, like I could start a conversation like, oh, hey, what are you, what's your favorite song? I love this one. Like, you know, and I'd start, hey, we actually just posted these photos up and people, it was actually like a real conversation we were having. It wasn't a scalable process, but it was a way to, for free, get new people to follow us, new people to visit our website, new people to engage with our content. And we were able to start to kind of do that at scale because I could figure out what worked and, um, and, and, and find a way to like kind of replicate that process over and over again. And so what was, how you can use that for your nonprofit is to think about, one, you can do just straight community engagement. You can find people who care about your cause, start conversations with them on Twitter or X, you know, or on Instagram and DMs and TikTok and things like that. But you can also find ways to do that, like in your email communication, you know, instead of just sending out a mass email and talking to people like it's just everybody in the world and hey, everybody who loves us and hey, all of our supporters, like talk to people individually in your emails, like, hey, you, you know, like addressing them that way. And not you, but like you use their names, right? And like, you can even ask direct questions like, hey, you know, we're working on this and we'd love to get your feedback on it. Like, if you just reply to this email, we'd love to start a conversation or ask for people's direct feedback on certain things and give them calls to action that don't just feel like it's a mass interaction, but it feels like it's a one-on-one -on -one communication between DMs, emails, you know, even social posts that are asking for engagement. Like, if you can find ways to make people feel like it's a, a really easy, simple, direct ask of them, um, and then you follow up with those people who do reach back out with like a, you hop on a Zoom call with them, or you start to build relationships, or you like learn a little bit about them and like, and then start to put them into, I don't know, some kind of maybe volunteer role within your online community or something along those lines, right? You start to really invest in people, give them a way to, help you grow while also you just kind of giving them those levels of community engagement where it feels feels more than just like here's an email we sent out to 10,000 people but it, it feels like that led for some of those people to a real relationship with your organization and people in it as well so two completely different tracks to answer that question but they're both really really valuable yeah, a really easy hack to do that even at at one is let's say you've got a new welcome email Siri sort of set up. Somebody signs up with their email address, they get this drip of emails that you set up and it's automatic. First email can be plain text and it can be like, hey, saw that you signed up. You know, I'm curious to know what made you sign up. Just hit reply and let me know. And then when somebody replies, yeah, now you are in a direct one-on-one, -on -one, right? And now you follow up with that. 
it's still at scale at the front end, but the moment somebody replies, now you take it into a one-on-one -on -one stream. Yeah, and that's a great example of that. Even doing that a few times throughout the year to your entire donor base, again, plain text, but just like we have this one one email, is the, the how are we doing email, which the subject line is how are we doing? And it's like, hey, dear, dear Cam, I just wanted to know, how do you think we're doing? Like, how do you think we're measuring up in your eyes? Do you feel like, yeah, we're communicating enough with you to tell you how you're making a difference? Do you feel like, just hit reply, let me know. I'd love to know how we're doing. And a surprising amount that. of people actually like take you up on that and write a very thoughtful response. I bet you get great data there too. So like there's so much you can do to just like look at numbers and be like, oh, well, posts like this or emails like this get more engagement. But when you hear back from somebody, like I'd actually just love to see more impact or like you guys are sending too many emails, please. You know, like things like that, you start to realize like, oh, wow, that was kind of a cheat sheet. I got to hear from someone directly what their actual experience was. I didn't have to in interpret data and think that's what it was. They just told me. That is such a great cheat. You know, it's great. It's awesome. Before we get into a little bit of content formulas or how to do this, I want to I wanna go back one more time to the authentic content piece because I think it's so important for, for two reasons. And I'll start, I'll start by saying this. Mm -hmm. I found a company the other day and their offering is that if you're a direct-to-consumer company, let's say you sell deodorant online, you've got a Shopify and you sell deodorant or cleaning products or whatever, this company will find, <laughs> will create reviews for you, but they'll create like video reviews. And what they do is they send your deodorant to like 50 people across the country. So somebody in in like Ohio gets the, signed up for the service, they get a deodorant, they get a package, here's a deodorant, here's roughly what I want you to say about it. They turn on their iPhone, they don't have a lighting kit, they don't have, like they're getting paid 25 bucks or 50 bucks per review to do this. They turn on their, their, their iPhone, they put it on a shelf, and they're like, hey, I just got this deodorant. They do an unboxing. They're like, here's why I'm excited about it. And then those like those videos get posted on the deodorant's website. Now, I'm not endorsing this whatsoever. These are fake reviews, but they look like real people, stuff that was shot on your iPhone. It's the opposite of what premium brands used to want. Right now, all of a sudden, everybody wants like real, authentic, organic content of somebody doing an unboxing video of your product, even if you're a premium aspirational brand. Um, so, so there's something there, right? Like there's something there that that the super overproduced shiny content for some reason maybe isn't resonating for everyone as much as it used to, and everyone's trying to be more authentic. So that's something we can we can learn from. And two, there's two tactics that. Cam, you talked about one of these, SEO, on the previous podcast, and we've talked about mm -hmm. paid ads. They're still working well, but they're certainly changing quite a bit. On the SEO side, you know, chat search is going gonna, is gonna to disrupt some of that, where I don't know if five years mm -hmm. from now, we're still going to be using search the way we're using it right now, which is where we type something into Google, you get all these results, and we might just type it into a chatbot and get the answer from a chatbot. So SEO might work differently in the future and paid ads with privacy laws changing. It used to be your targeting was really good. Your creative didn't have to be that good. You were talking to exactly the right amount of people, but now the targeting isn't as good anymore because of privacy laws. Now your creative and your content better be really, really good. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think those two things, which is just like this mass shift to more organic content, but also the importance of creativity in your content it is just like a solid case for any nonprofit to seriously think about content and and how you're going about it yeah yeah i mean i you think too like a lot of this has changed over the years too just because like think about when you search for something like i always just skip the sponsored ones at the top right because i know that those are just paid ads right they're not an authentic answer you think of like yelp was probably a big part of this like we started like not just looking to, you know, people who are reviewing that are probably getting paid, but like people who are just like sharing their, their normal experiences. Obviously TikTok is a big part of this where we were just looking for, you know, content from regular people. And we, you know, like the community just kind of lifted those people up a lot of times too, because they're like, they feel like, Hey, I, I was a part of making something happen. You know, a lot of times there'll be musicians on, TikTok that just all of a sudden blew up and now they're like touring the world and you're like, 
wow, like they, they were literally, you know, four months ago, just in their basement, like, you know, like on the guitar, on their guitar or like playing around, you know, in pro tools or whatever. And uh, now they're touring everywhere. I mean, and you were kind of like part of that story lifting up, not just, I think there's this, this like, uh, people are less likely now to listen to like a celebrity influencer and are more uh, interested in, in these micro content creators or just other normal people who are not like, it feels less like this is just a basic endorsement and they're like obviously being paid for this. And people are more just like, Hey, I, I just want to hear what people actually think. And that's, that's why like authentic content is so, so important right now too, for, for your nonprofit and uh, for what you're creating. But yeah, I think, I think you're, you're right on it. You know, authenticity is so important. All right. So we're all in content. Amazing. Seems like something we should be thinking about more deeply. Authentic content, thinking about creativity and content. How? I know you've got a bunch of stories of how, how you've done it. Yeah. So maybe let's start there. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a few great examples, right? Like I think so early on when I was in the, the entertainment industry, I was working with this just small bluegrass television channel here in Nashville, actually. And they were they were also a radio show and most of their posts were just like links to their radio show online. You know, it's so like, it didn't make sense. Like their content wasn't like optimized for social. They were reaching, I want to say it was 800 people a month through Facebook, right? Their posts would go out. It would reach 10 people. It would reach 50 people, right? And it would add up to like, you know, 800, less than a thousand people they're reaching a month. Well, we started to just look at, what content does work? So we test different things, right? We test out photos and memes that were specific to the bluegrass television channel, blue, bluegrass like audience and folk and Americana and so forth, right? We test out videos of people playing different instruments and playing songs and things like that. And I'd start to look at all the different details, right? I'd be like, well, not just did a video work better than a photo, but was it a square video? Was it a wide video? Was it a tall video? Not just was it a photo, but did was it a collection of photos? Was it a carousel? Was it what was in the photo? Was it a person? Was it you know a, a graphic that was just a meme? Was it like was there text on the photo or not? And we started to like I remember the first post that I went out that like really I was like this went viral. It was like it reached eighty thousand people, and I was like this is amazing. We didn't have a budget to run ads. We didn't even put a dollar into it. And then I saw one that reached 200,000 and like half a million. And then in six months, we were consistently reaching at least 2 million people a month organically through this, this Facebook page. And I was like, this is amazing. Like if you look at those details and you start kind of piecing these things together, it can really work. So when I, right after that is when I ended up going and working with IJM or International Justice Mission and we did the same kind of thing. Their, their social posts, that celebration content I mentioned, those rescue posts, it was clear that those were the most engaging, but they would reach maybe 10,000 people and they would get, I don't know, 900 likes on the post, maybe a thousand likes on a post. And I started just like digging in even more. I had this big spreadsheet, Mike, of like all these different things. I would be like, Photos, again, are they tall photos? Are they wide photos? Are they square photos? Is there a person in the photo? Is this a landscape of like the city that we're in? Is this an actual photo of the crime scene? Is this an actual photo? Like what's in the photo? What is the caption? Like how long is that caption? How many characters is it? Uh, under 50? Is it over 300? Is it like, you know, anything like that? What words seem to stand out? Do we use emojis? How many emojis? Which emojis? Like, do we have what well, words, like things like, you know, celebrate and thanking? And do we put text on the photo? We saw when we put text on the photo, we would get like a 20% increase in engagement. When we would put, when we'd say thank you in the post, just the words thank you. And we'd be thanking donors and we'd be thanking local law enforcement. There was like a 38% increase in engagement or something like that, right? And, and if we would, if we, in the first sentence, summarize why someone should be celebrating this, like, 
you know, five, five boys are now free from like labor slavery trafficking or something like that in, in the Philippines. And, you know, we would be, we'd use an emoji, some kind of celebration emoji, like in that first sentence, it gave people clarity about why they were celebrating this, why this was a good thing. And then we went on to tell their stories. So like we found on Facebook uh, and Twitter, we needed short descriptions. And in Twitter, we could actually take those, that same story and turn it into like, between five and eight tweets and still get some subsequent engagement. We would take those same posts on Instagram and tell a longer version of the story, like over 300 characters. And, and we started to see that like these posts are now reaching like, you know, 20, 30, 50,000 people. They were getting, you know, 2000, 3000. And in the first year we saw, over 5,000 engagements on the post. We saw it, we increased it by five times in the first year, but then we just kept growing it. Like in, in months later, we were getting 10,000 engagements on a post and the posts were reaching hundreds of thousands of people. And by the end, I think our best post, it reached like two and a half million people and it had 40,000 likes, comments, and shares on it. And the week I left IJM, we were the most engaged Facebook account, a non nonprofit Facebook account. Like we was tracking like over 150 different pages. And some of those had were raising like billions of dollars, like huge nonprofits, several times our size, you know, 10 times our size, 20 times our size. And we were reaching more people than them. They had, you know, we had like a a hundred, a few hundred thousand followers. They had millions of followers and we were reaching more people. What was really cool, though, is I was able to take those same formulas and bring them to small nonprofits. And the same thing happened. Those small nonprofits with teams of one, teams of three, uh, not a content team, just one marketing person. And we were able to find how do we tell these celebration stories? Like, how do we find those things that celebrate and show the impact? How do we tell it clearly? How do we figure out those same things? Do photos work better? Do videos work better? What size photos? What's in the photos? What... Is it, you know, a real authentic photo from it? Or did we have to use something representational? Was it, did we put text on the photo that showed, you know, what was to celebrate? Did we use the same kind of formulas in, in the text where, again, that first sentence was really clear about what to celebrate. And then it went on to tell a story and took you through the depth of it. And the, they were then reaching um, more people than organizations so many times their size, right? With no budget, sometimes it were very small budgets they were able to reach so many more people. And again, this doesn't just apply to social, it applies to the emails that you send out, the landing pages you create. The, the reality is like, we, I'm taking these ideas at its simplest form from those like high growth strategies at marketing agencies, right? Where you are looking at, you're testing everything from like, is the color of the call to action on this page green or blue, right? And you do A-B testing and split testing over and over and over again. But instead, we're doing it with every component of creative and, and finding out what we can what we can learn, what we can piece together and creating what will be those formulas, those proven strategies for your nonprofit. And again, it's it's a different strategy when you go on TikTok and you do Instagram Reels and YouTube Shorts and it's different than what you would do on your regular Instagram feed or what you would put on Facebook or Twitter, things like that. So kind of learning what those different strategies are for each platform for your cause and what content you have available to yourself to be able to consistently get those things in. Again, if you can't get it from the people you're supporting, get it from your volunteers, get it from your staff, get it from your donors. If you can't, you know, if you can't often collect the things from, like I mentioned in an education on profits, not just when someone graduates, like, yeah, that just happens one time a year, but what about someone got a great test score? What about somebody like joined a study group and now they're doing better in school? What about, you know, like telling the stories of already graduated students and what they're doing in life and what that looks like for them. There are so many things that you could capture. And so I would figure out based on your nonprofit, what are those, what are those things that you can easily get and you can get them a lot and then figure out the best way to tell that story. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to pull up our favorite fake charity again called Caring Hearts. And uh, as a reminder, Caring Hearts is an emergency shelter for women fleeing domestic violence. So <clears throat> their CEO, Amy Stevens, doesn't have all that much time to have a spreadsheet with all the like, which posts are performing better and anything like that. Mm -hmm. So she just needs like, she just needs a bit of help. Like, give me, just give me some frameworks of how I can start 
having a better content. Can we, I'm wondering, can we come up with like three to five like celebration posts or like types of posts that, that she can just always have in the back of her mind or have on a sticky note on her screen? Um, yeah. How's that sound? You, you, Absolutely. I love it. Yeah. Right. And, and, and by the way, if you're, if you're here in the chat with us and you have any questions on how to do this, like start thinking of them now before we get to the questions, like, you know, are you thinking about like bring, bring into the questions, like what, what is your nonprofit? What are you doing? We can talk about what kind of celebration content you can create. Um, tell me what kind of channels you're, you're working on and what social channels you use, like uh, bring questions about how you're creating content on those. Anyways, uh, we'll, we'll get to those, but Amy, as she's working on caring hearts, the first thing she's going to want to do is one, look through her existing channels scroll you don't have to have these big spreadsheets i'm a big spreadsheet nerd data and creative nerd like i love those things but it is just as simple for you to start by scrolling through your instagram feed and finding out which ones get the most engagement scrolling through your mailchimp or hubspot or whatever you use for email and seeing which ones get the most opens and clicks and look at those and do the same for the least engaged the, the least clicks and likes and shares and opens and, and determine what are the things that are most consistent among the most and least. So, you know, those with way too long subject lines don't get opened. Those that tall photos are the best on, on our, your Instagram feed because, you know, like they get, they take up more real estate on, in the app. And so people are more likely to see them in those photos. Did you put a Canva filter over it or was it just the raw photo? Which of those worked better? A lot of times we find that not having an overly stylized template works better, but, but see, but test and see, right? Like look, look through your channel and see what's working. So that's one thing that will help you figure out the framework of how to create those posts uh, and which ones to replicate. Now, what type of celebration content can she create? Again, I would think that she would run into the same situation where it might be difficult for her to collect information from the people she's actually serving, the women who are coming to the shelter, right? Now it's possible. I think that there, there would be some people who would want to share their stories, but I would think in most cases, you'd want to do this as to disguise their identities and protect their identities. And so use pseudonyms, this is, that's using a different name than what is actually their name, using changing some details of the story so that it can't be tied back to them using representational photography, or you can also use photos of people without their, like facing the other direction. We at, and at times had used uh, photos where faces are blurred or just identities are protected. And you can do it creatively. It doesn't just have to be a blurry photo. It could be like, maybe you have some kind of like branded way to like cover up someone's face, you know, with a heart or an emoji or something like that. Right. Anyways, um, you could do this in a way that you could collect those stories. You want to make sure that they're, honoring to the people that you're, you're you're posting about that they feel comfortable sharing their story you never feel like you're you're trying to push out a story that they they just don't want to share you want to make sure you're doing this and promoting dignity and and not having them relive their trauma there's a lot to the collection process so what i would say is see what see what of those things you can get out of those like which of those stories that you can consistently collect and if that isn't the story of someone who is now at your shelter it could be, again, in interviewing your staff and help them kind of share what difference it's made for them to be a part of the organization. I would also then talk to, to donors and see what it was like for them, why they joined in the first place, why they continue to give and have them share their stories. So you can you can share that. We, we often don't think of this, right? When, when you're buying product reviews are so important and those product reviews Talk about how that product helped this person make their life better. We don't talk about that a lot with nonprofits, but the reality is someone giving to a nonprofit, they're getting an experience. They're able to be a part of something and it changed their life too. You can get those stories. So I would find, I would have Amy collect those from donors as well and share why it's been impactful for them to be a part of this. And then, and then I would find milestones, you know, I would find, you know, general statistics about like, how therapy and you know they're maybe they're helping support people in court and in cases are one or like a certain amount a certain percentage of people are you know less you know, are safer now because of this like find some of those statistics as well as as just talking about in generalities like hey there are 
now a certain amount of safe people, people who are now safe. There are a certain amount of cases that are won. There are a certain amount of, you know, numbers and stats. If you can tell them again in a story format are also really, really valuable. Like I mentioned, that street that was now, now safe for families and children to be showing that transformation over time uh, is really valuable. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to get into some questions now. So Becky is going to come back up here and Becky, I'll hand it over to you to moderate the discussion. Awesome. Yes. Thanks so much, Cameron, for sharing. There was a lot of good stuff in there that I'd personally like to dig into a bit more. But first, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I just want to open it up to see if anyone does have any, or if anyone would be brave enough to come up and share the kind of content that they're currently using and how it's either forwarding your mission or maybe holding you back. Just give a couple couple seconds of awkward silence while people debate if they have a question. So we've got somebody in chat saying uh, that they're just posting pics, sometimes videos of everyday life, special events. They run an orphanage in the Dominican Republic, and they highlight specific kids, tell parts of their stories. Maybe we'll just pick up on that a little bit, Cam, and and riff on that a yeah, little bit. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I mean, I think telling the stories of, of the children you're serving is great whenever you can get those. Like, I see some some content that's really engaging and people really love of just like, the fun, you know what I mean? Like it's important for sure to have stories where you show the depth of the problem, right? Like you're helping people to understand how serious this is and what life was like before. But like, I love showing the like, I don't know, holiday parties of like kids dancing together and having fun. I love being able to show to like, you know, kids playing sports and doing things together and like those fun things. Like those are, that's great content for you to connect you know, collect from your orphanage. I remember Operation Christmas Child, they had this one post that like inexplicably went viral for them. And it was just this short little clip. So they were an organization that delivers shoe boxes full of like toys and notes and fun things and all kinds of stuff. And they just got this one clip. It was mm, 12 seconds long. And it was a kid opening a box and the look on his face, he was just like... And he opened it and he was so excited and so filled with joy. And like, there was no need for like there to be more explanation of the story or the depth of like why he needed this or why he was struggling before. None of that was needed. It was just like this moment of pure celebration and joy that he received this like really special toy. I want to say it was like a little, like a little orca whale or something like that, that he got and he hugged it and was so excited. And like that moment they had, they got 9 million views on this one little video. And I remember them reaching out to me being like, what do we do with this? Like, how do we capitalize on this now? And of course, like I said, like, let's, you know, let's run some ads and, and like retarget tar- target people who watch this video and see if we can get some people to donate and let's set up a journey and all those different things. But like, what was just so cool is that that moment of pure joy accidentally went viral and reached 9 million people. And it was just really, really wonderful to see how like, they didn't need to go through the traditional formula of like, things are bad. Now they're good. It was just things are really good right now. You know, so remember that as well as you're collecting that content. Can I ask a follow-up question to that, Cam? Because that sounds like trying to capture lightning in a bottle sometimes. Like you never know what what is going to hit and what might work and what might not. And you come from IJM where lots of the beneficiaries are vulnerable people who you may not be able to Mm. share content like that from. I'm thinking about, you know, food banks as well. What do you do? I know you talked about getting donor stories and such, but it's always the the beneficiary stories that donors want to hear and see. What do you do in that case when it's difficult to get that kind of content? Yeah, you know, sometimes it can just be a simple questionnaire, right? Like you could just be like, hey, look, we can't, you know, if we can't share your photo, we can't share your video. Can we just share a, a few details? Why is why is coming to this important to you? And they're like, oh, I, I don't want sharing that. And you can use my name or please use a different name. Like sometimes just a straight text post where you can, you know, either either put up a representational photo or you could you could do a TikTok real style video of just you talking to the screen and telling the story of like that person who came into the food bank and like lit up when they like you're telling somebody else's story that they've given you permission to tell, but it doesn't tie back to them, right? Like that that can be really helpful. I think too, like as you're collecting this content, 
start to part of that process too is figuring out what works, right? So for instance, say you ask people five questions and you highlight in one of them, you know, the, one of the questions is like, what, what food did you, did you, do you like getting it at the, at the market, right? Or at the food bank, right? And then they share maybe a few recipes of like what they've cooked. And you realize that did really well, like get more of that, right? So like you test that out. Maybe one of the questions you ask is like, you know, do you get healthier options here? And people are like, yeah, actually I used to like when I would get this service that would deliver food to me, it, you know, like that was also a nonprofit or something like that. They were giving things that weren't very healthy, but now that I come here, I actually get to pick out fresh produce and that's been really helpful to me. And so you share that aspect and you realize, oh, people really care about hearing stories about how people are getting healthy food now. So like what I would do is see which one takes off. So like I mentioned, the kid opening the box, they weren't prepared for that, right? But there are other points they could do. They could they could have a clip of kids opening the box. They could have kid, uh, a clip of like kids running around and playing with their toys. They could have a clip of like the kids sharing with other kids or kids bringing it back and showing to their families and showing their mom. And like, those are four or five different examples of that same content captured in different ways. And when they put it up, put those different things up, this is the one that took off. And so this is what they should replicate again. And so I think it's like, you know, say that they posted four or five different versions of it. And one of them got uh, reached a hundred people. One of them reached a thousand people and one of them reached 10,000 people. Well, you should do the one that did 10,000 again, right? It doesn't mean never try those ones again, but you get to learn a little bit of information every time you post a different variation of something. And then you get to say like, oh, that one worked better. Let's do, let's see how we can do that again. And now when you go back to the food bank, you actually change your questions because you know that, you know, questions that are bent more towards healthy food is actually more important. So you ask five questions about that now, you know, and so that it can help educate how you, how you even collect it. We're yeah. just doing an, an audit with an organization and they've got 468,000 Facebook followers. So close oh to goodness. half a million That's Facebook great. followers. Hmm. You've got an email list of about 3000 out of those 3000 people who've made some sort of gift in the last three years is less than a thousand and they're raising less than a million dollars. So a killer content game have done a great yeah. job growing a, a Facebook following, but haven't yeah. managed to take the likes to the bank, right? It's like, oh, we got all these likes. Can we deposit them somewhere and and like write grants? And so there is a question in the chat that relates to this, which is, is it better to just you know, share a video or or a video with a paragraph explaining what it's about. And then how often do we add the links to donate? And I think what the question is getting at is how do we turn likes into actual support into like dollars in the bank? Yeah, it's a great question. I think what you want to do is use each platform and each type of post for what it's best at. So here's a great example. If you were to put out a video and and add a link to it now a lot of times you know you would kind of be penalized for that right like in the sense like facebook would be like all right well this is a link post trying to get people to leave our platform we want to keep people here like we're facebook we're instagram we're tiktok we want people to stay on the platform and not go other places so they're like if you get good engagement we're gonna show to to more people so that you know again people are liking our platform even more because you created good content for us so you want to find ways to do use each part for what it's great at. Uh, a video is going to is gonna go best if you just really try to get a lot of engagement there. What's really cool about a video though is you could use paid ads to actually retarget um, specific views of a video. So you can tar retarget people who vo viewed that specific video, who watched 10% of it, 50% of it, 100%, you know, like 95% of it. It's different than other posts. So like if you just put a photo out, you can't specifically retarget that, that photo. Now, what's great here, here's a good example. Like we would, we did this with campaigns where we were specifically talking about uh, a type of casework that we were working on. And we wanted to run ads for people to give to those who had watched a video that related to that. So if we knew that, hey, you know, this first part, this video we're putting on social, it's meant to go and spread there so that we can then retarget with a pay with, you know, a hundred dollars or whatever you can get for ads. And then you retarget those views and then try to get them to you know, give. Similarly, like finding ways to use your organic and paid strategy together is really, is really helpful. I think like, you know, obviously we're talking about how to reach a lot of people and how to engage them because this content that we're putting out here isn't just like 
isn't a vanity metric. I think like that isn't a win for me that this organization has reached that many people on Facebook, but isn't converting people because the point of creating really great content and especially celebration content specifically that shows your impact is that it actually motivates people to give, right? Like my goal of creating those, those, you know, rescue posts. And when we work with other organizations too, we, we would send them out on social and email. We had text alerts. We did like messenger updates for some of them. Like we've sent these in out in a lot of different places so that people would see this. And what was really cool is we would correlate a lot of times sending out some of these donations, some of these posts with people and actually donating. We would time like, hey, this email went out today. People saw those social posts and we would see like an uptick in donations during that time. We also did, did then test doing things like, hey, if we sent out a rescue post in an email, what if we did ask for donations? And that worked too. It just didn't work if we did it all the time. So like I would say whenever you can, Try to get people to start engaging, start opening emails, start clicking things so that when you do ask, you ask directly and they're more likely to give. So here's a good example of that in email. We would send these, the celebration kind of a lot and people would open those emails and people would enjoy reading them. And there was no cause to action. I, I even remember writing some emails that just said, there's nothing to click in this email. We just want to thank you for, for like the work you're doing and the impact that you're making and kind of gave them examples of some stories and so forth. Well, because we did that, because people were opening our emails, we were then able to send out more direct apps during a campaign. So end of year campaign, you know, before maybe we could only send out a few and then afterwards people started to kind of unsubscribe. But when we created the celebration content first, people would open those emails a bunch, they would enjoy those emails. Then when we when we did our year-end campaign, we were able to prime them to open more emails and send more emails. We throughout, you know, like giving Tuesday and end of year and like this throughout December, we would send out one, two, three or more a week. And then leading up to like the last four days of the year, we would send out two on one day, one the next day maybe skip a day. And then the last day we sent out four emails in one day without unsubscribe rates going up and with every subsequent email fundraising more. So it's kind of like, how do you warm this audience and engage them without asking, without sending links, without asking to donate until you're ready to ask? And then it's a very clear direct ask. And because you've warmed that audience, because you've engaged them well, now they're much more likely to give. So kind of separating those up, how do you engage here and then make the direct ask either through that direct email or engage organically so that you can then run a, a, a small ad that gets people to actually directly donate. Well, we're out of time. Thanks, Cam, for, for hanging out with us today. Where can people find you if, if they want to know more? Yeah, I love connecting on LinkedIn. I'll just put it in the chat there, but I love connecting with people there and always down to hop on a call or grab a digital copy and just kind of get to know people and share. I love sh learning from each other and building community there. You can also find resources on my website at cambartlett.com. And yeah, but anyways, just love connecting with others in the nonprofit space. This has been fun, Mike. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for hanging out with us. And thank you who are in the room. And thank, thank you for those of you who are listening to this as a podcast for hanging out with us around the fundraising campfire. That's all for today. Here's my short action plan for you today. I said at the top of the episode that this was about engaging, but it was actually about celebrating and part of the flywheel. Most of what we talked about today was, was about celebrating. So here's the short action plan for you which is, it sounds like maybe we covered a lot and it might sound like it's a lot to do. So after you listen to this, just think about what are some of the ways, what what is good stuff that's happening in our shop that maybe we don't often share with donors or we don't share enough of with donors. Some stuff that you might take for granted, somebody who's supporting you may not even know about. So what is, what is good stuff? What's good stuff that's happening that's worth celebrating? What is stuff that you would update your team on? What's something that you send out an all staff email to or an email to your team, to your development team? And just like, hey team, just wanted to let you know this is something that happened. This is awesome. Thank you for all your hard work. Anytime you do that, that might be an opportunity for you to think, huh, 
I wonder if our supporters would also appreciate knowing some of this. Some of it will be relevant to your supporters, some of it won't. But you're smart enough to figure that out. You, you've, you've got the intuition. Just think about what is celebration stuff that we can share more frequently and more often with our donors so that when we do ask for support, we've earned the right to ask for support. And they will be in a place where they will be much happier to give because they feel like they're an important part of the team and they feel like what they're what they're part of is effective and it's doing a, a lot of good in the world. So as always, thank you for hanging out with us around the funders and campfire. If you want to be part of these future Build Good Live events, just go to buildgood.com, put in your email address. As a thank you to you, we'll send you a short video mini series on how to improve your copywriting. If you're listening to this, you're my kind of people. I'm your kind of people. Thank you for the work you're, you do. I'm your host, Mike Dirksen, cheering you on as you build good in the world. Bye, everyone. <laughs>